Hi, this is Scott, and this is Optics Tutorial 10 for my YouTube video blog, Optics Realm. Today we're going to talk about achromatic doublets. So the, the goal is to understand how an achromatic doublet works, how to get the how to solve for the focal lengths, how to build one up, and how they work. So what is an achromatic doublet? An achromatic doublet is two dissimilar optical materials that have a focal length that shares, um, a, a, shares a common focal length or common focal point with the two wavelength extremes. In the case of visible, that would be red and blue. And the middle wavelength is going to be defocused. That's just the nature of how these work. In the visible, that would be green shown here. So some definitions. Chromatic the, uh, is an adjective, and that the root meaning is that it that it has color. Whatever you're applying that to, it has color, or that focus shifts with wavelength. Likewise, achromatic means without color, or a, the noun version, achromatic, like a lens, either a doublet or a full optical system, is without color, which implies that the focus doesn't shift with wavelength. But that's false because really, in optics, achromatic actually denotes two wavelengths having a common focus and the other wavelengths go elsewhere. So here's the anatomy of an achromat. You've got a, a positive uh, crown glass cemented to a negative flint glass. Now, crown glass, if you recall from the last optics lecture, it got that name because it was plate glass that was blown and flattened in the center where the pole stuck into it, they would stamp with the royal seal, which was a crown. Crown. This glass is usually lower index. It's got lower dispersion or high V number, high Abe number. Remember, those two are uh, inverse, inverse of one another, dispersion and Abe number. And a flint glass is uh, negative power. It's going to have a high index. Normally, they're higher index, higher dispersion. And flint because they uh, the original form of it they used uh, flint rock uh, out of, out of uh, the riverbed to create it. Today we use we, we tend to put lead and other interesting materials in to, to dope the glass to give it that uh, high dispersion. I just briefly want to touch on the history. So who invented the achromat? And there's two versions of history, and it appears like we really don't know who made it. So on the left side here, we have John Dolan. He, on paper, he got the patent. He, you know, in theory, he's, he is credited with the invention of it. If you recall, in 1757, he refuted Newton's dispersion uh, experiments. And in 1758, he published about the achromat with very little equations. And he got a patent that year, and he received the Copley Medal from the Royal Society. And uh, he died soon thereafter, and he was uh, appointed optician to the king. So that's on, on one side of the argument. The other side of the argument is that it really was invented by Chester Moore Hall, who was a gentleman, you know, country gentleman, natural philosopher that was a little secretive about what he did or not open about it. He never published. There was no documentation. So here's just a quick summary of the invention of the achromat. To me, this is really, really fascinating. And time is in the vertical axis, so we've got early time here and late time at the bottom. Recall George Ravenscroft, he invented flint glass uh, by, by doping it, going away from flint rock, uh, river, river rock, and putting lead glass into it. And Sir Isaac Newton, he concluded incorrectly that all dispersion in glass was constant in 1704, pretty much because his uh, instrumentation wasn't good enough. Now, this yellow box here is circumstantial. It's not, it's not clear if this, is the, the historically, if this is historically accurate. This is credited to Ramsden in 1789, and we'll talk about him on the next chart. So the, the flow of events was that Chester Moore Hall invented the achromat sometime in 1730. And to keep it secret, he gave one glass to one optician and then the other glass element to another optician. Now, I just, you know, supposed here Edward, Edward Scarlet, one optician, got the crown, and James Mann got the other, a flint. These two men happened to subcontract to George Bass. And 
either he or John Dolan figured out that those two radii at the interface are matched. Now, uh, it's documented that George, uh, that John visited George Bass in 1757. So maybe John Dolan got the idea from there. Maybe he, you know, who knows? After John Dolan's death, a lot of London opticians started making acromats. And of course, it was patented. They had to pay royalties. And this, you know, at the time, it was spectacle makers that were making land surveying, optical instrumentation, telescopes, and microscopes. So in 1760, 1764, 35 spectacle makers came together and they petitioned the crown to stop Dolan's 1758 patent. Now, at this point, John Dolan had passed away, and his son who, and business par partner, Peter Dolan, successfully defended that patent, which was valid till 1772. Now, Peter, at that, you know, fighting off the spectacle makers, actually was joined with his brother-in-law, jo uh, Jesse Ram Ramston. But in 1789, he attacked John Dolan's claim by reading a, a letter to the Royal Society on Hall, Chestermore Hall's contribution to the Acromat. Now, Hall had died previous to this. And it was a very persuasive letter, but we don't know if it's historically accurate. Here are my references. I get the majority of it, majority of it from the, uh, the harvard.edu, um, this article from Richard Sorensen out of Indiana University, as well as Wikipedia and some optometry and some other websites here. So how does an acromat work? This is really, this is, here's, the, here's the equations. Now recall, an acromat will put the two wavelength extremes, red and blue here, and the middle, green, at some other focus. So we'll start with a, the total power for the lens, which is actually going to be the power of the crown, phi1, plus the power of the flint, phi2, minus their product times the thickness. Now, each of these is going to have a principal plane, and there is going to, even though they're cemented, there's going to be some thickness here. For sake of argument, we're, we're going to assume that lens separation is zero. And from last tutorial, we found that a single lens's axial color is proportional, the, 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 the change in focus, change in power, is proportional to phi1, uh, proportional to its power divided by its Abe number. So for this lens, the total dispersion is phi1 divided by v1 plus phi2 divided by v2. Now we've got two equations, power and setting the total color to zero. Two equations, two unknowns. You can solve for the power of the crown and the power of the flint. Now I've rearranged these for uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you look at it slightly differently. So the first row is based on power from the last chart. If you prefer to work in focal length, it's really the inversion of that. If you're going to enter these into a ray trace code, you need to enter radii. So I've solved for what radius you need, assuming an equa, uh, an equa radius solution, biconvex, biconcave, and it's this third row here. Or if you want to do a, con a plano convex concave lens, and it's this radius here, so it's a factor of two different. Here, uh, and this is uh, from last time as well, this is a glass map, and this is showing index in the vertical, dispersion in the horizontal, and I'm doing it for three different glass types. Uh, I think next tutorial we'll discuss some of the makeup and what's in these materials. Here's an example. Let's do a crown of SFSL5. This is an O'Hara glass. And we'll do the flint with SNPH2. And the, the index, you really want to take the center index, N sub D and, v, and uh, Abe sub D. We'll select a total focal length of 100 millimeters, just plug and chug to get an equiconvex, equiconcave. The crown has a 71 millimeter um, biconvex, and the flint has a 495 biconcave solution. If you enter this, if you try to enter this in a ray trace code, Make sure to start with a zero thickness, otherwise the color solution probably won't come, come in. How do we look at color? Well, if you plot the, the focus versus wavelength, you get this chromatic focal shift. So in the vertical, we've got wavelength. In the horizontal, we've got focus shift. 
and you can see the blue and the red come to a common focus and green is out here at some other focus. The distance between these two from green to the common blue red is referred to as a secondary color. Next optics uh, YouTube lecture, I will go into talking about that, how to compute it, what it means, and uh, how to minimize it. Finally, I want to briefly touch on Seidel aberration theory. Seidel constructed, he, he shows how to compute for a complicated optical system up to third order aberrations. And I just briefly wanted to simplify that and show it for, for axial color. Now, really, Seidel, he did this on a surface-by-surface -surface basis, but we'll look at this for sake of clarity. We'll look at it based on elements. So the axial color is proportional to the sum over all the elements of the marginal ray height squared divided by the dispersion and also divided by the, fo the focal length of that lens. You, you, make, you find this, this term here for each lens, and you sum it up over all the terms, and you get what the color is at the image plane. So recall marginal ray comes into a multi-element system and it's going to be dispersed like this. Or if you think of it a collimated beam, you're going to have multiple wavelengths there. And this is, this is uh, pure linear axial color shown here. This formulation is for wavefront. If you want to get like the ray error, so for instance green has no ray error, red has some ray error. If you want to get what that that is, you have to take a derivative of the wavefront. Here's the homework number 10. This first question I was trying to leverage off of the last homework, but I screwed up how I asked the last homework. I got the powers a little bit wrong because my calculation had lenses with one millimeter thick. I should have done zero millimeter thickness. But regardless, the first question is to design an acromat made of BK7 and SF6. Solve for focal lengths, power, and radii for the, the two cases. The second problem is a little bit of a trick question, and it will prepare your mind to get in and understand secondary color. And the question is designing, again, an acromat with FPL 53 and BSM 81. And then once you've calculated that, I want you to find the difference in the red-blue focus to the green focus. And... Uh, It'd be very interesting. So that's it. Thanks for tuning in. This is uh, Scott from Optics Realm. Be sure to like the video, post comments down below, and tell your friends. Thank you very much.